our sixth our sixth annual event. Uh, so going back to uh, Heidi, uh, who was uh, so supportive of the events uh, back back you know back in in 2012, I guess. Um, the year after I began doing these in, in 2011. Who's been to the events before besides this nice gentleman here, that lovely couple? Hello, everybody. Um, uh, as always, I like to begin the program by saying that your access to me and the information that I can share doesn't end when the program ends. You can take one of my cards. There's a stack of them there in front of the monitor. You can go to my website, see my endless calendar of travels. Now it's loading photos. There we go. Where am I? There we go. Festive, festive holiday green. That's actually a close-up of a Wedgwood plate uh, behind that looks that, that just looks very, very Christmassy. Um, uh, these events have been just wildly popular ever since I started doing them back in 2011. <coughs> and part of the reason for that, I think, is that people like the fact that this is not a shopping trip for me. I never offer to buy or sell on a commission at any of these programs. People like that. They know that I'm not here looking to pick up a bargain and turn around and sell it and make money on it. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what an antique dealer does. I'm not an antique dealer. I am an appraiser only. These events that I do at libraries, historical societies, senior communities, banks and financial planners have started to use it as a client appreciation program. Uh, so these events and the house calls are all that I do. And for people with big things or fragile things or a lot of things, the home visit option has been uh, a very popular one. If I'm already in town like this for a program, there is no mileage charge. It's just $75 an hour. We can do an unlimited number of items in that time. So if a home visit is something you think you would benefit from or enjoy, um, uh, again, you can take one of my cards. You can see when I'll be back in the area. I'm already completely booked for 2019, uh, including many stops in Minnesota. Uh, and I have, I think, 20-plus events booked for 2020 already. So <clears throat> it's, a nice, it's a nice problem to have. But if you do have things that you want to sell, and I know many people do, um, I'm always happy to point folks in the right direction, either to a good local or regional auction house. I have a lot of collector uh, and dealer contacts and, of course, my colleagues on Antiques Roadshow. And for the ninth year in a row, the nice folks at WGBH in Boston invited me back on the Antiques Roadshow tour. Um, I'll be just as curious to see the results of their five stops this year. All the stops were outdoors. They've never done this before. Um, and so those the new programs will begin airing any day now um, for the for the 2019 television season. Um, I'll be just as curious to see the results because I was not able to join them this year. I was too busy booked with my own programs. Um, but uh, uh, that's okay. You know, I, I love being on Antiques Roadshow. I love being part of the gang. But as you may know, we don't get paid to be on Antiques Roadshow. And we have to pay all our own travel expenses. So what do we get? We get the visibility and credibility of being part of a wonderful program. Not a day goes by that I don't get a phone call or an email or as, as a result of being listed on their website. And we get to be on TV. That's fun. So we'll, we'll talk more about Roadshow during the, the program today. Um, people often ask how I got started in this crazy line of work. Like many of you, I began as a collector back in the 1970s. In the 1980s, I was a, a part-time dealer. My full-time job was I was a mild-mannered newspaper man. I was a reporter and editor for papers first over in Green Bay and then for most of my career just down the road at the Post Bulletin in Rochester for about 24 years. But I was always involved with antiques on the side, working at auctions and antique shows. In the 90s, I started writing antique reference books part-time and I quit the newspaper business in 2002 to write the books full-time, and I've written 27 books on various antique and collectible categories. Um, all the, my books are all out of print now. I thought my book writing days were over, but my publisher called me last year, and he said he wants a book on, on downsizing. <laughs> the magic words I hear on all of my house calls. The kids don't want this stuff. What are we going to do with it? So we'll see. That may be... 
that may be a project for 2019. No matter how many of these events I do, I never know how much I know until I am presented with a question or a puzzle or a challenge. So let's see how much I know. First up, Lynn Gorman, or Gorham, excuse me. Oh my. Okay. My goodness. What, how did this picture come into your life? Um, my parents, I remember like middle school or high school, they came home one day and said, we got this antique Napoleon picture from somewhere that they picked up. They like to pick up antiques. So they uh, said it was an antique and that's all I remember. I don't know where they got it. Okay. I don't know. And somehow I ended up with it. It's, it's, it's very old. It's uh, probably almost 200 years old. Okay. Um, it is a it is a style of picture that uh, or style of ceramic that we would call uh, creamware. Uh, it's low fired. It's meant to stand up to. I mean, it's mostly just pretty. Uh, I don't know if these were ever actually used as you know a milk pitcher or a cream pitcher. It's. Um, Considering its age, it's in pretty good shape. It's got some tight hairlines, but uh, it was it's, made it's in the mold. Around. It has <laughs> traveled around, it's, but it was made in the mold, so there has to be more of them out there. The website that I use more than any other for, for tracking down information on antiques and collectibles is this one. It's called liveauctioneers.com. This is a free website. Anyone can use it. You have to register with them to get to the values. But it's a free website. Um, now, in in I think it was made in England, and they would call it a jug. But we'll we'll start with a Napoleon pitcher. <coughs> Excuse me. See, I have a feeling that the term here, rather than pitcher, is jug. But we'll see. I tried looking online for Napoleon Kitchen and found nothing that looked like that. So maybe Jug is a better... Yeah, yeah. And, and um, again, I think this may have been part of a, a larger, uh, you know, place settings. See, there are several in stoneware. There are transferware styles, but no... Pitcher. So let's see. And the, really, that's part of of just knowing. See, look at for for we for Napoleon pitcher, there were seventy three results. For Napoleon jug, there are almost five hundred. So let's see. It could be Staffordshire. Light green, Alfred M. Evans, Toby. Well, this is not a Toby. This is a transfer design. That's the same one we saw earlier, 300 pounds. There's a set of them, 190. These are Tobys. Now we're getting down to about 100 bucks a piece. Yeah, I think that's probably a fair range, a hundred, but clearly this is not a this is not a common piece. Because we're down now we're down to fifty bucks a piece. And none of them, not one has shown up. But it's old. I mean, this dates from, you know, the Battle of Waterloo. Yeah. Early, early nineteenth century. No, I don't see. I don't see another one. But in this condition, um, I'm guessing a hundred to a hundred and a quarter. Okay. And if you ever want to sell that, I can put you in touch with someone who can help you do that. Okay. 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 <laughs> Hello, Ann. Hi. Good to see you again. Thank you. Good to see have you. a have a seat. Thank you. Have a seat. Look at this. My it's, dad thought it was a mastodon. Uh huh. St. Lawrence Island, Gamble, Alaska. It's inked and it's scrimshaw. It's part of a part of a walrus 
Tusk, I believe, rather than rather than Mastodon. Um, there's good news and bad news about this. The the good news is that it's the it's real. There are so many bad, you know, fakes uh, and and imitation pieces that this is this is the real deal. And it's decorated with a sperm whale and a walrus and a seal. There are hunting rifles. There's fishing material. Uh, the bad news is that it cannot be sold at auction. There are no auction houses that will accept ivory because of the Endangered Species Act. <coughs> so if you, this was something that you wanted to sell, it would have to be sold independently. I'm sorry, really? How, how did it come into your life? Well, it was my dad's. He right. got it in Alaska, and <coughs> he bought it up there. I don't know who he bought it from. <laughs> For instance, in January of this year, here's a really, really fancy... <coughs> it's a cribbage board mm -hmm. decorated with bears and seals and other little things in here. I can't tell what they are. $550. <clears throat> now, it's possible that this is a pan bone. Nope. Nope. We're doing better the other way. So, scrimshaw, uh, you know, is a, is a sailor term that uh, you know, pieces pieces have been around forever. Uh, in April of 2016, fossilized ivory tusk, which which I think may have you know helped explain why your dad <coughs> thought it was uh, mastodon. There's another one, fossilized walrus tusk, multicolored, sold for 1,600 bucks. Um, and in great condition, 17 and a half inches long, so half again the size of this one. Mm -hmm. <coughs> a great, great piece. I would say, though, probably four to five hundred. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's very, it's in fabulous condition. Great. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, yeah, this is also, this is all, this is, this is very, very old. This is, this is, this is fossilized. Tusk or 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 or, or bones, all the same source as the other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting that that pieces like this have amazing uses today. There are luthiers, guitar makers, who 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 use fossilized material like this mm -hmm. in a fretboard or inlay on the top of a guitar. Uh, this. I think I think can be sold, uh, at least privately. I see if people make uh, knife handles out of it. Knife, absolutely, absolutely. We mm. want the most recent information now. Cane handle, that's interesting. There's one. Here's a piece. Fossil elephant tusk section, Cedo uh, Inland Sea. Hmm. 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 There we go. There's one. It looks remarkably like that. Amazing. Amazing. When this was offered for sale, um, in uh, last October, a year, October 21st, 2017, they were thinking 1,200 plus for one piece, but they don't give, oh, it's 20 inches long. Okay. Nauman's elephant. They were a type of prehistoric mastodon found in the Sido Inland Sea of southern Japan. So, so, you know, I think you're probably... At a minimum, you're probably now they didn't sell, but still a thousand maybe for the pair. 
let's see what else we have here. So your molars, teeth. There's one for sold for one seventy five, but you know maybe that was maybe that was just too am, maybe too too ambitious an estimate. Mammoth ivory, yeah. Here's a here's a collection that's all carved though, small pieces. I think retail. What does that one sell for? Didn't sell a baby woolly mammoth. How do they know that? There it is. Twenty oh I see that's silly. Twenty five thousand. But Artemis Gallery, they're in um, they're in Louisville, Colorado. They have they do a pretty good business. I'm gonna say that's a thousand dollars worth of mastodon or or, or uh, elephant tusk. Thousand? A thousand for the pair. Yeah. Well that's a pretty that's, that's pretty he can he can we can, we can come along if he wants. So so where'd you get this fancy bowl? I just came from my mother-in-law's stuff after she passed away. Okay, it's uh, it's interesting. The mark on the bottom is the is the letter W in a star in a spider web, and that stands for Whiting, the Whiting Company. Okay. So Whiting uh, made silver. They also made silver plate. This has a style number on it of one thirty-four. People often often say. Can I polish it? Yeah, and absolutely, I absolutely, oh, okay. you can polish it. The thing to remember, though, about silver plate is that the 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 plating is just it's microns thin, and if you use an abrasive polish, it'll take the silver right off. So just make sure, and you can absolutely polish it up. Uh, it's a little all metal bride's basket, as opposed to the ones that have a uh, that drop in a, a little glass piece. So what we're looking at is a whiting, silver plate, footed bride's basket. So you wouldn't use a cleaner to clean it? I, I would I would make sure that it was a fine cream. Fine cream. There there are also dips that you can use, and the dips will just eat it away. It'll just it'll take it all off. See, a lot of these are these are sterling pieces. There's there's whiting. Let's let's look for let's look for silver plate because that's too many. <clears throat> there we go. That's more manageable. It has a bale handle. What did you call it? A bridal basket? It's a it's a bride's basket. Okay. Mm hmm A pair of them for but again, those are sterling. Um, it's had a little bit of a hard life. It's got a little it's got a few little dent, dents and dings in it. But it will clean up beautifully. If you could, if you saw it in an antique shop, it would be fifty or sixty dollars, I would think. Sounds good. Thanks for bringing that. Thank you. Okay, that's a fancy, fancy lamp base. I have a few. These often came in pairs. How did this come into your life? Uh, our son was in the joined the army, and he was in boot camp down at Fort Sill in Oklahoma. Uh huh. And we we're down there visiting him, and then we drove around and saw this uh, little shop there. So we stopped in there and, and what kind of a globe or, or, or top does it have? Is it's it a regular light bulb? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't have a it doesn't have a, a, a globe that fits in here or any kind of a shade. Okay. Well, you, obviously you can see the screws. Yeah. So it, it was, it, but it didn't have that when you bought it. No. Okay. No. Well, it's it's what it's made out of what's called spelter. It's pot metal. Okay. It's very lightweight uh, for a for a, a you know a what you would think would be a massively heavy because it's not magnetic. Um, so it's a spelter lamp base in a in a kind of a, a rococo style. Uh, it's pretty busy. It's the, the style is late Victorian, but it was made in 
probably the just post-war, late 40s, I would think. What's that yellow stuff in the hole then? On the... That's just that's just some part of the yeah. That's just some of the residue from the from the gold okay. plating on here. And do you remember what you paid for it? I think about fifteen dollars. That was that was fair. There's still a little upside. What I want to know is what did the shade look like? You could get just about any kind of, you know, uh, clear or frosted shade to put on there, even a globe, a round globe. Okay, yeah. Um, that would complete it. But as it is, uh, fifteen dollars was a fair price. I don't think there's a whole lot of upside no. to that. Yeah. If someone offered you twenty bucks for it. Take it should up. take it and run as fast as you can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Ooh. -wee. Okay. Earrings to match. There we go. Garnet. Yeah. So we have a a, a really wonderful, uh, probably late Victorian, probably 1880. 1890 Victorian ring and matching uh, little little pierced earrings. Oh gosh, they are just gorgeous. Where did you get these? My mother purchased them in Munich, Germany in 1934. Garnets have kind of had a resurgence in popularity. Really? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So what we have is a really wonderful garnet ring. The mounting is good quality. It, I think it's a low carat gold. Is there a mark on it anywhere? I don't see one. But the plate, it's very well made, very European. Just absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's funny how different styles and, and, you know, Victorian designs in general are completely out of favor right now. However, garnet, garnets are, are not. They are, hmm. they are, they That's are very, yeah. All right, so we want to change this to just Victorian. All right, that's a manageable number. 81. Garnet. Garnet rings. For instance, and now this is 18 carat, but look at that style of ring and compare that to this one. See? Again, these kind of tiered design. They're all beautifully placed. Yep, they're all well they're all well cut. It's an old it's an old mine cut style. <clears throat> that whole selection there with a brooch, earrings, it looks like a little crucifix and the ring in 18 karat gold, $200 for all. When did that sell? That sold in uh, last October. For instance, here's another one. <clears throat> A whole suite of a very similarly styled ring, earrings, and a bracelet. See? And look at the look at the clasp on the back of yeah. those and the clasp on the back of that. They're almost identical. They've got a little they've got a little catch there. Yeah. There's the ring. 14 carat. See, this is not I don't see a carat mark on here, but I think it's a low carat gold. And there's the bracelet. And the whole set sold for $400. So I think at a minimum, you're looking at a hundred and a quarter for the whole set. Um, I'm sure that it was part of a suite. So you probably would have had a matching brooch at some point, a, you know, a bracelet. And I you got- I don't think she ever did. Yep, yep. Necklace, 
You saw all that's left is the earrings and the ring. But yeah. do you ever do you ever wear them? No, I don't because I don't have pierced earrings. Oh, but okay. I want my daughter to wear them if she wants to. But she has a um, nickel allergy. Yeah, and I'm wondering if that's these really can, common. Yeah, I wonder yeah. if these can be coated or replaced. Or I think they 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 look like they're they look like they're gold. I don't think you would need to worry about nickel so. there. But but you know I. Uh, it would be, it would be, that, that's a very common allergy, I know. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, I'm, I'm going to say a hundred and a hundred and a quarter for the whole, all three okay. pieces. Okay. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Who's, who's your friend? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, she, it's signed here. Mm -hmm. It's signed here. It says, Anita Claire Martin is the artist. So what do we, how did how did this girl come into your life? Oh, I found her at a at a thrift store. Okay. In um, Yucca Valley, California. Hmm. So it's it's a piece of, of pine or fur, hand painted. It's a caricature mm -hmm. of a of a big eyed blonde with big big dangly earrings. The date I'm thinking is probably it looks very 1960s to mm -hmm. me, doesn't it? Don't you feel like that too? Um, but I don't. Ed, have you done any research on Anita Claire Martin? The only thing I find she's one of the Little Rascals, a minor character in the, in the Little Rascals. Really? Yeah. Really. Not like Darla Hood. No. No. Not that. Not that famous. No. Always had. I always had a crush on Darla Hood. <laughs> Uh, well, let's see. Is there anything else out there by Anita Claire Martin? No. I think I got it spelled right. There's rock and roll memorabilia. There is. There is all kinds of entertainment-related stuff. Yes. Oh, no. I had found paintings by her. Yeah, yeah. Well, in this database, there is there's there's not much. So I mean, it's as 1960s caricature art. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's still collectible and fun. I don't think terribly valuable. Less than a hundred dollars, mm -hmm. I would say. Do you remember what you paid for it? I think about eight. Eight dollars. Well, gee, it was a thrift store. Yeah, it was so. a thrift store. I guess, I guess so. I, you know, it, 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 I would say forty. Yeah, I, I couldn't pass it up. I no, no, not it. for, not for that. It's, you it's, know, it's too, so. where, where do you, do you display her in the house? Yeah. Yeah. Where, where do you hang her? In right? the man cave. In so. the man cave. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Beetlejoy, I believe. Uh, tag from Lake City. Uh huh. Clothier, but we cannot find any dating on them. Okay. Well, I mean, it's got to. It's. I mean, it's. It's a. It's just a classic, you know, Beatles style, mm -hmm. collarless jacket and slacks. Um. Wow. Let me ask you this. Yeah. What are these? <laughs> those are. Those are. I think. Let me here. Let me lay this down. I think that is for attaching a uh, uh, suspenders. Okay. Yeah, yeah, to just clamp onto. Wow, it's just so. But I mean, this would have been sold in Lake City. Mm -hmm. The Selk store. Are they still home of forty famous brands? It says. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. Well, wow, the condition is just fantastic. I mean, it really has a wonderful kind of a shark skin quality to it. Um, I mean, if you could, if you know, Paul McCartney's going to be playing in Wisconsin <laughs> this year, you know. No, he's going to be in Madison and he's going to be in Green Bay. Okay. I, you know, if you showed up or if he showed up wearing this <laughs> at the concert, I think... I. 
Paul, there's someone's going to get on stage and sing with them too. Someone in the audience. They, there's a contest oh, going. <laughs> How cool would it be to have someone wearing a a shark skin suit that looks just like the ones that they posed in? Uh, that the Beatles posed in. How cool would that be? All right, so these are all chagrin. Oh my goodness, they're trying to sell that. Uh, men's brown polyester two-piece for eh, that's not quite the same though not quite the same the market for vintage fashion is is pretty healthy uh there's a there is a um uh a, 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 a flea market in Chicago, in the West Loop, called Randolph Street Market, and um, yeah, there's the boys wearing their wearing their famous collarless suits. Look at even the piping, even the piping on the pockets is the same. Interesting, interesting. Um, in there, I you know I think you're probably looking at. Well, it depends on the size, but it looks like a looks like a pretty standard size, three or four hundred, I would think. Um, uh, but the condition is great. But again, you have to be able to display it. Unless you have a mannequin, it just stays on a hanger. You know. Uh, yeah. The the difference here is that you don't have the the piping on the on the front, but the pocket trim is the same. See, there's no vertical. There's no, there's no, there's no vertical no, piping. No. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. But I mean, it's fabulous. At Randolph Street Market, that would be okay. easily, I think, a three hundred dollars suit. Good to know. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for bringing it. Hello again, William. What did you bring me? A typewriter. It's a, it's, it's a wireless device. It has no wires. And it's, and it's an Hermes. Where did you get this? You got it for your eighth birthday. And how old are you now? Ten. Ten. Do you, and do you write on this? Does it work pretty well? I was writing a story. Oh, I see that. As the police station sat at his desk, he puzzled over the case at hand. Do you want to be a writer? Good. Good. Write. It's, it's fun to be a writer. I can, I can attest to that personally. But this is the, the Hermes Baby Portable Typewriter. Look at that thing. It's fabulous. Also, I would think 1960s. Don't isn't that isn't that have you found it have you done any research on Hermes? I mean, I think of Hermes as a as a designer of of clothing. Spelled at least it's spelled the same way. It's always nice to see young people at my programs. Most of the people look like me. But but I'm glad to see I'm glad to see you here. How many is there another Hermes typewriter? There is. There are 48 of them. My goodness, I've never even heard of Hermes typewriters. Can you see this, William? Look at these. Look at all these here. Yeah, come on over here. Now what's this one? There's a because it's got this nice Right? It's got this nice metal cover. It does kind of look like that one, doesn't it? See, now there, right there, it says Hermes. Oh, with the official Davy Crockett Frontier pouch. What is all that? What is all this junk? Okay, there we go. There's the typewriter. Yeah, I think that's it. Now, there's something else. There's another mark over here, but otherwise it's the same. It has the same red trim line. Do you have any trouble finding ribbon for it? Because that's usually the challenge to find. Nope, you'll be able to find the ribbon. Okay. Well, this whole collection of all this other stuff, uh, that whole collection sold for 30 bucks uh, with all this other non. See, that's it. Look at there. 
It's got the same, it's got the same little fancy, fancy silver buttons. So that's it. I think I think the typewriter all by itself is worth about 30 bucks. Thank you. Well, listen, keep in touch with me. I want to I want to know how your how your stories are, are going. Let's see. That fits down over there. Oh, there, perfect. So it's a it's a it's a little a little votive candle holder made out of a a tin can that someone took and they and they twisted it all to make it look all real real fancy. Now, Matt, you would describe this kind of as as tramp art. Yeah. Tramp art is a collector term that we use to describe um, a notch carving in in wood. Uh, but when you got this, they called it tramp art. Um, my mother-in-law got it from a garage sale and was labeled as that. Okay, it is. I mean, this was a this was a, a craft in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, you know, they usually made. You can just take that right out, and you can see it's just a tin can that they cut up with a, a snips and decorated with all these curly cues. You know, it, make, it makes me think of of macaroni art uh, pieces. Ten dollars and twenty five cents was the price on this. Boy, if you could get someone to give you ten dollars and twenty five cents for that today, you'd be doing really good. Uh, I think that was a little bit of a little bit of a strong little, little bit of a strong price. I was just a few bucks, I would think. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for bringing it. That's pretty cute. <laughs> pretty cute. That's Buddy Lee. Right? Did you know that? No. Oh, okay. So Buddy Lee was a an advertising character that would would come in all kinds of different outfits. Now he's wearing little Lee bib overalls. He's a composition doll. Composition is a term that we use for doll parts made in a mold using sawdust and glue and rags and ground up bone and all kinds of different things. This this Buddy Lee is pretty darn cute. He's got a little he's got a little kind of a kind of a t-shirt on there. But but they they came in dozens of different outfits. So this is Buddy Lee in just the regular regular uh, bib overalls. I just want to see if we can get, that's ah, all right, we'll leave him there. He's okay. He's well supported there. The issue with composition though is that it tends to crack. It does not age very well. Uh, he's a little bit, he's a little bit grimy. He could, he could, he could use a little cleaning. But there are almost no doll hospitals left anymore. It used to be that when your doll was got dirty or was damaged, you could send it off to the doll hospital, and they'd clean it up and send it back to you. The doll hospitals are almost gone now. In fact, I'm I'm hoping that someone will will let me know where there is a good doll. There used to be a good one in the Twin Cities area. So what we are looking for is a Buddy Lee. This one is wearing just bib overalls, but wait until you see the variety of these dolls here. All right, so there he is with a pocket. He's always glancing to the side. There he is, little striped, striped overalls, good condition. 60 bucks for that one. There's the Lee, right? 13 inches tall. Um, I think the rarest of all of these. Now, some of them are, are pretty elaborate. There he is as a train conductor. He's got his own little lantern. He's got his hat. He's got his overalls. 180 bucks for that one. Mm -hmm. But the rarest of all the Buddy Lee dolls is, I think, is the Coca-Cola Delivery Man. Look at that. There he is, in his little suit, little low, there he is, 200, and that's, that's, that's low, 250, 150, look at this one, this is two years ago, but the condition 
is, is almost like new. 800 for that one. That was two years ago. So anyway, there, there are dozens and dozens of uh, different styles of Buddy Lee dolls. Uh, there's one, 1950 Buddy Lee Coca-Cola doll, 1400. So if we just look for a Buddy Lee composition, There are just like 80 here. So you've got Farmer in a straw hat. There he is with the shirt, 90. There's a, there's a Philip 66 uniform doll. There's one right there with his little hat, 100 bucks. Look at them all. So anyway, now you know that that's a Buddy Lee. He's in pretty good shape. Even though he's a little bit, he could he could use a little cleaning up. That's still a, a easily a, a fifty or sixty dollar doll. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Very You're much. welcome. Oh, I love old photo albums. Celluloid covers. Eighteen ninety, I would think. This one has kind of an Art Nouveau design. Is this is this your family? That was my okay. My, my grandma's when she died, we found them in her in her apartment. Okay. This is these are called cabinet photos. Oh. These are all about four by seven. Oh. They have they have oh that's a great one. Look at all the hats. Wow. Um, the cabinet photos were big enough to be displayed in a cabinet in a closed cabinet. And so that's how they got their name. They were replaced eventually by what we call the CDV, carte de visite, visiting card size, which are you know just a third of the size of the cabinet photos. When they're just folks, when they're just people, they don't have a whole lot of value outside the family. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's one with two little, two little babies in a chair next to a little girl. Every once in a while you'll see a picture of a baby like that, and you'll see two disembodied hands coming out from behind, holding it in place, making sure that making sure the little the little deer doesn't tip over. Oh, now that's that's great, guys with bicycles. Um, that's a that's at least a seventy-five dollar photo right there. Yeah, when they're just folks, they don't have a whole lot of value unless it has some some extra. Now, see, there's the there's the holders for the CDV style, the CDV size. There, there's nothing, nothing in there. Okay, good. So the the albums themselves don't have as much value as the as the uh, images inside. Let, now let's see here. There we go. Carlson, you could have get, you could have guessed that those were, that was a, and there's Yalstead. A lot of them are missing in there. Every, a lot of them are, are empty. Yep, I see that. Yeah. I, I, you know, you never know what you're going to find. I, I was looking through a photo album like this once, and I found a picture of a woman with four legs. <laughs> she was at at the at the time. She was a really famous. What they call the carnival freak. She 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 had she was married. She had children. She traveled all over the world. She was very wealthy, but she had four legs. Oh, boy. And so and she was you know you, you, and you can still find images of her online. Um, so so that one of the two guys with the bicycles mm -hmm. is worth more than all the other pictures put together. Oh, hey. So but that was that that one photo. I'm going to say seventy five bucks. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Let's, uh, let's let everybody see it. So this is a, a little newsprint banner for the Burr Robbins Circus. And then it's double-sided. Let's look at the other side. Oh, my goodness. Where did you get this? Um, and they were in Cannon Falls. Okay. And, uh, I got it in a box at a yard sale. There's a box of papers from 1880s. 
1880s. I got the whole box for a dollar. Burr Robbins' new gigantic shows, Immense Menagerie, Unrivaled Challenge Circus, College of Biggest Giants, Oceanic Aquarium, Racing Carnival, Japanese Troupe, uh, Mystic Desert Born Arabs. Wow. And the Mighty Big and Mighty Big Whale Exhibition. Good Lord. Um, you know, I mean, this is a category that we call ephemera. It was something that would have been posted at some point mm -hmm. and used and then thrown away. The condition of this one, even though even though it's on newsprint, is just amazing. It was folded up in a railroad uh, time schedule book. Okay. For, and that's where I found it. I've been through the box many times before I actually found this in the box. Have you found any other Burr Robbins posters? No, but the research I did on him was uh, that he only had this whale, this stuffed whale, these last two years uh -huh. of his circus. And I think it was 1886 and 1887. That it's, you, can, you can tell a lot about the style of printing. And, and late 19th century, it, it makes absolute sense. And then I think um, when I looked it up, this Thursday, August 18th was in 1887. So that's kind of how I think it's from 1887. There was a circus train set for the... Um, the Burr Robbins, where is it here? There it is, Car 58, Burr Robbins, and it, and, and, it, and it talks about that. That one train, on one of these cars, it says Burr Robbins, and the whole set of them sold for uh, $250, 22 pieces, wild. Um, as far as a poster, I've seen that too on eBay. Right. But I've never found an actual poster you know, or broadside. Um, circus memorabilia, especially now that the circuses are, are fading away, um, uh, it has becoming more and more collectible. Uh, I'm, in Wisconsin, where I live, you know, we've, of course, we've got Baraboo. Mm -hmm. We've got the Circus World Museum. There's another, one, another big circus museum in Florida. Um, but as ephemera and Americana, this should be sold at a, by someone who understands um, great, you know, pop culture and Americana from the late 19th century. And if this is something that you want to sell, I mean, it's not colorful like some of the posters right. would be, but it, that, that it survives at all is nothing short of amazing. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna thinking three to four hundred would be a fair price. Uh, but until another one, until you can find one that's been sold, it's all speculation. It's all speculation on what it might bring. Uh, I love it. My, my brothers, Bill and Jim, are directors of the, of the Hamilton Woodtype Museum in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. They would love to see something like this because this was all from handset type, mm -hmm. you know, and then printed that way. I think I think three to four hundred. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you much. You bet. Pretty. We have a few more pieces. That we're okay. Interested. Yep. Say. Yep. 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 So so fancy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's all right. It's all right. No no extra charge for that. Uh, all all gilt decorated. There's a there's a creamer and a sugar and cups and saucers. What do you know about this? It was a wedding present to my parents. Her okay. brother was stationed, I believe, from Germany. He yep. was stationed there, and he sent it to them in 1947 for their wedding. And, and, and it makes perfect sense because it says, it's Hutchenruther is the name of it, but it says U.S. Zone. Mm -hmm. So 1947 makes perfect sense. Most of these had no function except to look pretty. I mean, it, look at the, the condition of the gold on yeah. there. Yeah, they've never been used. Mom and didn't even have them on display. I'm the one, I have a shelf that they sell. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. It's just absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. But you know, these were, these were more showy. This one has a little bit of a rock, little, little bit of, 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 a, of a rock to it, so it may have been, it may have been a second. But anyway, Hutchenruther, is a very well-regarded 
uh, name uh, of, of, you know, manufacturer made in Bavaria. Um, there are plaques, there are cups and saucers, there are, uh, let's just try this. Yeah, I mean, this would have definitely have been definitely have been P, uh, T rather than than um, uh, cocoa or chocolate. Look at look at the profile on this. It looks like the same teapot, different design. Yeah, uh, pretty close. A little scalloped on the top, gilt decoration. This is a Demitas set, where this is a full size, you know, cups and saucers, also little, little gilt footed piece. So a mix, two different styles, one more modern, one more classical looking. Let's just try, let's just look for U.S. Zone. But I mean, these are, this is a high fired vitreous china it's meant to stand up to you know not and not heavy wear but but you know regular wear once or twice a month perhaps they did figures they did pretty girls they did uh Look at this, five years ago, set in sterling, that whole set with gilt decoration, 700 for the whole set. The other, the other set that we were looking at was $60 for the whole set. Uh -huh. That's probably about uh, right for something like that because, again, it ceases to be used for its intended purposes. Mm -hmm. It just looks pretty. Right. And, 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 and most of them had no function except to look pretty. And they do. They look great. Um, here's 92 pieces of Hutch and Ruther, marked U.S. Zone. And again, this is a transfer design, so the design is laid on like a decal. Oh, there we go. Bavaria, right, in cell. There we go. 175 for 100 and for what 92 pieces service for 12 so whatever you're doing keep doing it because it's in great condition okay okay thank you look at that mom and cubs and some someone in the in the background philip r goodwin let's see what the back looks like oh man red green would be proud <laughs> of the taping job I didn't do on it. the back of this picture. Where did you get this? Where did you get this? I got it from a friend. Okay. He got it down in Red Wing at the airport. There used to be a bar there. Okay. They had an auction. That picture was in there. Okay. And he said, that's the ugliest thing i ever seen, he said. <laughs> he says, you can have it. I said, okay, I'll take it. All right. Well, well, it's uh, the original was a painting by an artist named Philip R. Goodwin. This is a photomechanical print. It's a picture of a picture. If you look at it under a magnifying glass, you'll see that the image is made up of a t of tiny... Here, you take that, look at it. Look at the bear right there. Can you see the dots? Tiny, tiny little mm -hmm. dots? Okay. Yeah. When you see that dot matrix, mm -hmm. you know that it's a photomechanical print. It's a picture of a picture. So... So they, they took the original painting, they photographed it in such a way that it could be reproduced. And, and it's also been in the sun because photomechanical prints that, that are get hit by the sun every day turn this kind of greenish color. So, so you paid how much for this? They gave it to me. He, it, you, it's worth, you paid nothing for it, it's worth ten times that. <laughs> so it's still worth nothing. It's still worth, yeah. Decorative value only. Yes. I could give it to my grand, great grandson. You absolutely could. I'm okay. sure he did. 
It's it's the three bears. Yes. Yeah, two guys fishing. They don't know what they're doing. No, they don't. Okay. Okay. <gasps> I'd look at myself to see what I could do to improve. That's my answer, Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown hates that answer. Well, of course, it's it's a peanuts panel created by uh, Charles M. Schultz. They he, they called him Sparky. It, that was his nickname among all the other cartoonists. How'd you get this? Picked up at a garage sale. Okay. It's it's kind of had a little bit of a hard life. It's mm -hmm. got some it's got some water damage. It looks like um, some of this some of this may have been added to over time by someone with a little little crayon. It's a great. I mean, it's a classic. It's a classic peanuts, but it's not an original. It's not an original drawing by Charles M. Schultz, uh, because you can see, yeah, it's printed. Yeah, it's just it's printed on there. It's not it's not an original. Hmm. It's not an original drawing. Yeah, Charles, the, the originals for these. This is not the format, the size that that Schultz worked. He worked in a smaller format. The the comic strips. Are, I'll show you. I'll show you some examples. And there, there are there are collectible, and valuable, uh, Schultz original comic strips that have been inked. But I'll show you the difference in size. Okay, here is a drawing on signed on on paper by Schultz. Look at them all. They they are they are very collectible. There he is. There's Sparky. You know, the signed drawing on paper, uh, about seven by nine for a single panel. But but you can see that this is, yeah, this was this was a probably a store display okay. for cards or something like that. Um, uh, do you, what'd you pay for it at the garage sale? Ten cents. Ten cents. If you wanted to sell this today, you could double your money. It's worth more than Burl's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Considerably more. Here's a, here's a whole Sunday spread. And you can see he dropped the, they drop in the standard peanuts, and then he signs it. So this was a Sunday panel. And that measures 26 by 33. So that's about the, that's a close in size, but you can see that that's printed on there. It's not an original drawing. Okay. There he is, the greatest. The greatest. That classic pose. So where did you get this? Where did you get this? I got that at the uh, Field of Dreams at the Mall of America when it first opened back in the Okay. 80s. Yep, there's a there is a guarantee of authenticity from someone at the at the Field of Dreams down there in Dyersville. Hmm. Okay. So so there is a lot. I mean, this is late. You can you can see how Ali signed it. Yeah. Yeah, that looks good. Um, there's a lot of Ali's memorabilia out there. This is a this is a famous. I mean, what 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 we see images on boxing gloves, on trunks, on on robes, and on photos like this. Um, so, what, what mid '90s, early '90s? When did the Mall of America I open? Think yeah. it was maybe mid '80s. Well, I, the Mall of America, though, didn't open in the mid, mid 90s. He couldn't sign anymore. The land at 96 it was just a scrabble. You remember he had Parkinson's then? Or? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. This was way before that. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I'm just saying if you got it at the Mall of America, though, that I don't think that opened until after 1990. Yeah, yeah. All right, so. Um, what were they getting for these back in the day? I paid six hundred for it, I think. Yeah, and and you know, it all depends on 
I mean, here, for instance, here is the same photo with a note from Muhammad Ali uh, signed and inscribed. Uh, Ali, thanks for the help received from him paying for room rent. to said Eddie 88 in his hand. Uh, and then that sold for uh, 260 euro. Last time I checked, the euro was about a dollar. Fifteen, a dollar fourteen. Um, it's it's in it's in great condition. Keep an eye on the mat while well, the mat's all been colored in. Uh, if you, if the, I was going to say the edge of the mat when that starts to turn brown, but that's already already been colored in. I think that was a fair price, but I think that was more of a gallery price. I don't know that there's a whole lot of upside yet um, because he did sign a lot of stuff. Uh, I mean, there's a there's another one picture of him with Frazier also, and Frazier also signed three fifty. What's the top? What's the top price? Trunks, nineteen seventy five Ali fight worn fight worn trunks. From the Thrilla in Manila. There they are. And see, that was signed late, but those sold for $130,000. When? In 2012. I don't think you could get that for them today. I don't think they would bring that today. See, you've got the robes, you've got, you've got belts, you've got shoes. You've got gloves, and then you've got the photos. There's one twenty-seven hundred, a whole collage, but that was nine years ago. You couldn't get that for it anymore. So, I think I think six hundred was a fair price. I don't think there's a whole lot of upside anymore. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's a religious painting on copper. Okay. And I don't know how old it is. I okay. Got a friend who passed away. And I think it's old. It's Germany, kind of. Okay. Well, copper paintings on copper are are well known. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's the it's the it's the, the Christ after the after the the whipping and after the crown of thorns. Oh yeah. I just want to see how it was created. It's, it looks like an original mm -hmm. painting on copper. Yeah, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Probably it may be, it may have been cut down from a larger image. You've got a, you've got a one little, one little piece there. The, the subject matter in general, religious art does not, command as high a price, even something as dramatic as this. Uh, but it's it's very, very old. I mean it could be well here, let's let's just see this. Um, you refer to as a school of copper painting at the turn of the nineteenth to twentieth century. Okay. I think it's older than that. Yeah. Yeah. So we would call this an old master style. Uh, there's an auction company, coincidentally, in Cedar Falls, Iowa, called Jackson's, that um, uh, specializes in, among other things, religious art and memorabilia. Italian school, 17th century. There again, also Christ with thorns, oil on copper, 28 or 29 by 23 centimeters. What is it? Two and a half inches. So, so a little half again as big, I would say. And this one sold in July for 2,000 euro. Here's another one. 
17th, 16th, 17th century. That's mm -hmm. what I think this mm -hmm. is. Five hundred. How big? For tiny, just you know, like this, mm -hmm. like that big. But clearly, this has condition issues. The yeah, the paint the paint is that. flaking off. Well, restoration would be very expensive. It would be. It is very expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but if you wanted an opinion on on restoration, um, you know. I can put you in touch with my restorer that I have been working with for years and years. A um, couple hundred in this condition, I would say. Uh, it could be stabilized. You also have the Upper Midwest Conservation Association. That's, that's attached to the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. Okay. They do museum quality work okay. and they charge museum quality prices. <laughs> but but they, they do fabulous work. I mean, I, I'm not saying anything against them at all. They, they do they do great work. Okay. And there is a fabulous clock. It has mercury in the pendulum. That. Want a little history on it? Sure. It's my grand great my grandfather. Okay. He was a banker who made his money in lumber, coal, and oil at the turn of the nineteenth to twentieth century. Uh huh. Uh, that's his family, his very large family. Okay. And this is the house he built. It had an elevator, Woo. a telephone system. He built it in 1905. He died tragically of pneumonia in 1925. This was on one of seven downstairs mantles. They had seven okay. fireplaces, and this was the main piece. Okay. So when my mother died, my brother got the gold pieces. My sister took the diamonds, but I wanted the clock because it <laughs> meant a lot to me. So it's... I'm it's, more interested to learn about the history, but if you have the value, that's great too. Sure. Well, it's made by Ansonia. Ansonia is a was a New York company, right on the How do you face. Spell that? I'm sorry. A n s o n i a. Okay. Uh, right on the face, you see the letter A in a diamond. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So this was made by Ansonia. This is a this is a, a classic beveled glass uh, Ansonia shelf. A mantle clock in in uh, bronze, not brass. The however, I want to talk about the pendulum. The pendulum has mercury in it. That's hazardous material. That needs to be disposed of as soon as possible. Okay, that's a that's a health issue. So whoever, if you live in this area, you know, contact someone who you know in the county or the city deals with hazardous materials. They will take care of that for you. So what we have. So would you recommend I would have somebody make steel rods of equivalent weight to keep the pendulum working? Um, not necessarily. The pendulum will usually run pretty well on its own. Even the mercury doesn't weigh that much. Okay. Okay. Any more about the clock company come to mind? I can re I can look it up and I can give me the name. Were they around? For a long time. Oh yeah, they made clocks for the American mm -hmm. middle class. This one has the open oh. escapement, and there it is. There it is. Yeah, the exact same clock. Does it say what year it was made in there? Um, this is 20th century. Uh, like I said, he built the house in 1905. I would imagine he bought it. When that's he about what's well, what the clock dates from. Yeah, yeah. That one sold in July for 120 bucks. With the mercury. With the mercury. <laughs> With the exact same mercury right there. Wow. So I, I, I don't, it's a beautiful clock. I mean, this is an auction price. So, you know, a retail price might be, might be <coughs> twice that much. But I don't want to make light of the, of the mercury. That's hazardous yeah. materials. And I went into, like I said, I went into the price, but now I can start researching. Yep. That. Yep. that was what I was interested in. Yep. And Sonia Crystal Regulator. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so what do you know about this fancy, fancy clock? Down family tree. My okay. great grandfather made it. Okay. Okay. It's a kitchen clock. Uh, they call these kitchen clocks um, because they, the, that little dial in the middle could be set as a timer. 
Do you know that it's also an alarm clock? No. Okay. Okay. Uh, this was a factory-made clock. This, this wasn't handmade. So this would have been made in a factory by, you know, uh, Welch or Waterbury or Ingram or Seth Thomas or someone like that. Very nice, fabulous reverse painted decoration on the, on the glass. Uh, they call this time and strike. So there's one winding hole for the clock mechanism and one for the chiming mechanism. It's an eight day movement. So you only have to wind it once a week. Does it, does it run well? Good. It keeps good time. Okay. The idea of having a chiming clock and the reality of having a chiming clock are two different things. Some people run them for a week, they make so much noise, they never wind them again. It started off that way. Yeah, right. No, no, no. no. It, so, so whenever you see a kitchen clock with a brass dial in the middle of the face, you know that it's an alarm clock. So this is oak, kind of... Um, Kind of uh, almost like a like a Renaissance revival style. See, and they all have they all have this that dial in the middle of the face. Now that's pretty fancy. And that one, Tommy Harris down in Marshalltown, <laughs> Iowa, sold that one for sixty bucks. These used to be one hundred and fifty dollar clocks. That was a long time ago. Now they bring about half that, about sixty or seventy dollars. There's a pair of them that sold for a hundred and ten. But see, they all have in the middle of the face that little brass dial. So, so it, it, the glass is in great condition. The the clock face is worn, but that's okay. Um, top price today for this retail would probably be about. Uh, 100 bucks. Oh, 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 a fabulous, fabulous pendant. Uh, grape clusters. And there's a bird on the back. And I there is a there is a bird on the back. Where did you get this wonderful? It was a great aunt. She went to St. Olaf. She graduated in 1950. No, yeah, 1950. Mm -hmm. She's gone and I got a box of stuff. A lot of, I took some over to Chicago, Ed. He said it's just custom John's jewelry. <laughs> right. Well, and I mean, I the, that was kind of different because you know, they, it's so layered. It is. It is beautifully layered. It has. It's. It's has a wonderful 3D quality to it. Mm -hmm. But you know, they want you to look at this side because that's the money side. But when you look at the back, you can see how it was made. Mm -hmm. It was stamped oh, rather okay. than cast, and so you can see that it's hollowed out. It is, as far as I can tell, it is completely unmarked. Costume jewelry is still a pretty healthy market mm -hmm. if it is marked. Okay. Uh, unmarked costume jewelry, they, 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 pretty much, they pretty much sell it by the pound. Mm -hmm. uh, they, put it in, they put it in plastic bags. This, I'm sure, was part of a suite. There would have been matching uh, earrings, oh. a bracelet. Mm -hmm. Uh, a brooch, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, but this has a wonderful uh, three-dimensional quality. So not only are there grape clusters, there are. It looks like that might be like a pomegranate. There's also something else like a thistle or something like a some sort of blossom. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the some of the the leaves are kind of crimped over and bent, and that's because it's so lightweight. It's it's it's. But the date is around the turn of the century. Okay. Uh, I think probably 1905 mm -hmm. uh, or thereabouts, maybe 1910. But because it's costume jewelry mm -hmm. uh, and unmarked costume, uh, at most maybe ten dollars. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I got a free. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You wear it? No. Oh, it's very That's pretty. I've been trying to point it off to my kids, but no one. Oh. <laughs> The kids, the kids don't want this stuff for no, some reason. Don't. It's a horsey. Yeah. It's a, it's a little, it's a little horsey, pull toy, paper mache. Oh, he's wonderful. Where did you get this wonderful horse? Well, I believe it was my dad's. Okay. I would say somewhere around 1930. Okay, I think it might be a little earlier than that. 
It could have been his older brother. Um, uh, those those tiny tiny little wheels. Look at that. I mean, today we treat this, we treat these as sculpture. So this is a circus horse, pull toy, paper mache, wooden legs. Yeah, there's the hole for a string. I can't imagine pulling this no. very far because <laughs> it wouldn't. It just wouldn't wheels. go. But it's just it's just great. It's just great. Um, oh, mache, not macho, mache. There we go. And see, they all kind of look alike. Look at this guy. 19th century horse pull toy, see? Hand painted, kind of a. This is also dappled. Little, that's a little tiger maple uh, base, though. Two hundred, two hundred. When did that sell? Uh, last April, a year ago, April. There's one. German pull toy and pump is. Look at that guy. And that's in tough shape. Tiny, those tiny, tiny little wheels. That whole set sold for five hundred and fifty bucks. Hmm. So I mean, he's in he's in absolutely wonderful condition. He's missing an ear. He's missing an ear, but that's okay. That's okay. See, a lot of them are the same dapple gray. See that one right there, eighty bucks. There's another one, a hundred. So I think at least a hundred dollars for this guy. He's just absolutely wonderful. Okay, I have three pots that okay. my grandmother got in the 1930s, mm -hmm. and I'm going to put them all up here, and you can okay. tell me which one you want to talk about. Okay. She and my grandpa traveled to southeastern U.S. Okay. Um, and I think it was in yeah. the 30s. Yeah, this is Mexico. That's a tourist piece. That's very, very, very inexpensive. This is very heavy. And a little bit later, that looks like Zuni. Uh, but this one is, you knew that. You already knew how wonderful this is. So this should be signed. Oh, I don't see a signature. So I mean, this is a this is a, a a double wedding vase, hand decorated. They they these are not thrown pots. They they make long coils of clay and they build them up and then they shove them into piles of burning dung to to fire them. Um, so this is a wonderful Southwest uh, double wedding pitcher or vase. Uh, it, but again, this one, it's quite heavy. Many of them are just are just feather light. Um, Navajo, Zuni. See, that's a basic shape for a wedding vase. A double that that double spout design. See, would um, this have been a usable pot or for the tourist trade? No, these were these were presentations for these were typical wedding gifts, um, uh, and some of them were for the tourist trade. These two were definitely. This one is a little better quality. A little better quality. I mean, there's a really there's a really fancy one with figural. Anytime any any figural piece you see, for instance, those are usually pretty good. But there's a lot of them out there. There are many many variations. The double spout of the wedding vase. 
But I just want to see, I love this design on here, this wonderful geometric design. That's very well done. 200 probably. Um, I'm really surprised, and it may have been it may have been obscured. Usually they are signed. Okay. Oh. Yeah, that's really good. That's a good one. 200. Thank you. Okay. Perfume, perfume bottles. I just the last program I did they had they had vials. They had cameo glass vials. Is this is this your collection? Do you collect these? I have a few, yes. Okay. Shocking de Chaparelli. Wow. <laughs> and I love this one, the little the one in the in the form of a of a little little uh, English cottage. Devon violets. Mm, smells nice too. So so why why perfume bottles? Oh, uh, I don't know. They're just pretty. <laughs> um is this one frozen? I think no, that no, one opens up. There's it does. In there okay, too, so. all right. Then we'll then we'll be very careful. So that one, that one has a signature on the bottom, the numbers on the bottom. Right, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Nui, Nui de Noel. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, very nice. I'd just like to know the time frame that that was made. That oh, that's screaming Art Deco. That's 20s, 30s. Isn't that what you're, yeah, isn't that's that what you're thinking. feeling too? Yeah. yeah. This one this one is pretty, but not a whole lot of value. It's nice that it still has the, the label, but um, uh, uh, do you have any, any of the vials, any of the cameo? They're tapered? No. Do you know? Okay. Well, we'll I'll, I'll show you what some of those look like. All right, so this is, whoop. there we go, and I believe that is, that is Baccarat, and it is, this is a Baccarat <laughs> bottle, and there it is right there with the same little so there are original packaging for these. This one doesn't have quite this much. Four, so, so Baccarat, the four of those sold in six years ago, $650 for the set. For, for um, uh, one is Le Tabac, Blonde, Blonde Tobacco, Nuit de Noel bottles, three inches, one missing the label. So, you know, a hundred and a half probably, maybe a little more for that one. Do you have any of the packaging like this? No. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. I wonder if we can find any for Devon Vials. There are many, many variations of Nuit de Noel. Look at the, the I love the, uh, uh, the balloons, the hot air balloon form. That's very cool. There's another one there. There it is, right there. So how do you know that it's an old one? There's a way that age sits on a piece, and you can also see the design of the label okay. is absolutely right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me just see. You got a whole bag of tiny perfumes at an estate sale for five dollars. Oh my! That one was in there. <laughs> Oh my. Well, I mean, this one says, this one though says Devon, fragrance of Devon violets. I love this. I love the box and I love the fact that it's in the shape of a, of a little cottage. I, but, I found the cottage ones online, yeah. but never with this box. Never yeah. seen that box. Oh. Uh. There are several, several here, but not with this box either. Yeah, I mean, if this one sold for a, is worth a hundred and a half, that one to a to an advanced perfume collector, two hundred maybe a little more. What do you I would think, think the age of that one is? That's hard to tell because that looks that label on the top doesn't look terribly old. Um, 50s. 50s or 60s, I would think. 
Oh, they're great. Anything figural, anything in the shape of, of a, you know, a bird or a house or an animal or something like that, that, that will always have a collectible market. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for bringing them. My mom was Pat Rabine. Which, yeah, so she inherited things from generations. And this one, I think, was, uh, it belonged to, her, to my great great grandmother who was okay. the wife of the um of Wilbur Schofield who started with his brother Schofield's um drugstore back in the 1860s. There is a there is a, a a label here on the bottom but it's very hard to read. That's my problem. <laughs> oh, uh, some pottery something pottery I can see the word pottery, and there's a blue stamp, a blue ink stamp. It's really blurry. It is. But, it's um, very blurry. We That's have okay. All a right. local um, antique expert, uh, okay. Chuck Drometer, took Good. a look at it. Oh yes, Chuck. Chuck was at the used to be at the yeah at the countryside. And um, he said this one's really old. He didn't know what quite what we should try and charge from it that he said okay that, that was his opinion well it's a transfer <laughs> it's a transfer decorated pitcher or jug very lightweight probably english uh, so that this design of irises was laid on like a decal okay and uh and then a little gilt decoration um it was almost certainly used for buttermilk and I say that because all this discoloration, all that brown discoloration, get, the animal fat gets into the glaze oh, okay. and discolors it. And so, I mean, it could have been milk, but I think there was a, there was a high fat content in that, in that container. So it is a, it is a cobalt uh, decorated um, iris pitcher. Now those are Majelica designs. This is a transfer. Let's try one other instead of cobalt. It's not flow blue, but it's kind of it's kind of like a flow blue. See, look at the compare. These two. Now those are those are both syrup pitchers, but again, to see the design with the gilding around the edge mm -hmm. and on the handle. So this is these are syrup, and this whereas this would have been milk or or buttermilk. The pair of those sold. Uh, they did not sell, or did they? No price here. Uh, ninety dollars each, but that was um, a long time ago. That was eleven years ago. You couldn't get that for it today. Um, uh, so about half that. But that's probably that's probably about right. I would say thirty or forty dollars is about right. What the the crazing and the glaze hurts the value too. Yeah. The the ceramic body expands on on a microscopic level at a different rate than the glaze does. And so when, yes. as it's expanding, it causes that fissuring all over it. So very nice transfer decorated iris pattern, Staffordshire, but I can't make out the mark. It's, yeah. just, it's just too blurry. I was just hoping you go, oh yeah, I know what that was. Yeah. <laughs> it says, I can see the word pottery. That's all I can know for sure. Thank you very much. Good, thank you. <laughs> that's an oil, that's an oil on canvas. No, I'm pretty sure it's oil. Here, let, let me let me face face this way over here while you tell me where you got this crazy painting. I picked this up about 30 some years ago over on the island of Hawaii in a flea market on a tree. And we've never been able to find out anything about it. Is it signed anywhere? Not that I we cannot can find see. anything. 
I've tried on the internet and everything else. I cannot find any artist or anything in Hawaii that would even be associated with it. It was down in the hippie community down at Kahoa, south end of the island, where all the homeless people live in the island down there. Well, let's 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 think about how this was created. There's all kinds of cultural and artistic references. There's there's Da Vinci right there. There's a lion, there's a soldier, there's butterflies. I mean it looks like it looks like someone on a bad trip. That's what you know? I well, that's kind of up and, the and but having said that, and we don't we don't mean on a cruise ship that kind of trip. There there are mushrooms, there are all kinds of crazy amorphic images. Um, marijuana plants or everything. Yeah, yeah. It's well. So, so, what, what were you thinking when you bought it? Did you, did you I, like it? Bought it? My boy and I were down there, and we had a house over for quite a few years, and we were just go flea market all the time. And we picked this up in the community down in the commune, actually. If you're familiar with the islands, there's a big hippie. I am area. not. I am not. My, I have never been there. On nope. the south end of the big island, there's a hippie community and all druggies and everything live in the village down there. And it's like you go back in time when you see the people there. I bought some other stuff, but this was, I've had this over 30 years. I love it. I think it's just fantastic. What did you pay for it? I don't even remember. It's been so long ago. Not much. Well, it was clearly, was it on a stretcher when you bought it or was it loose? There. It was rolled up. This is, look at all this testing of paints here along the edges because it comes right up to the edge of these really finely done, finely done. I mean, it's 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 just got it's got so much. There's a unicorn. There's there, thousands there. and thousands of little hundreds and hundreds of little faces yeah, in here. Yeah, I yeah. thought somebody did the faces separately. Like yeah. there was another picture within here and then somebody mm. else did all this other weird. There's Stalin. I, I don't know. Joseph yeah. Stalin down there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well I just thought if I brought it in here and let you look at it, I've never had a to appraiser. It's it's a really wonderful yeah. uh, you know, psychedelic painting if we would call this outsider art today okay, that's what um, uh, it, it should be it needs to be restored however it needs to be, be put on a new stretcher it needs a little light cleaning in I mean because you've got a lot of paint loss it's losing paint down here this is pretty the way it was when I got it okay okay well if you if you wanted to sell this, I can put you in touch with someone who can help That's you do why that. I was interested. Okay, yeah. all right. So so um, we'll roll it back up again carefully. I had two offers from New Zealand, but that wasn't a good offer. What what was the what was the offer? Forty five hundred. You you turned down you turned down forty five hundred dollars for this. I figured it was worth more than that. Without knowing who the artist is, I think that I think you probably should have taken forty five hundred. Yeah, but you should send it to you should send it somewhere that they're used to dealing with outsider art, and that's that's an auction company in Beaufort, Georgia called Slotins, S L O T I N. Yeah. And so, I don't know if it's his own music yeah, or mortgage. It's a, a these these large indentured documents were usually they, they usually had to do with aid uh, with with land. Um, some of them are quite early. It's on vellum. It's on animal skin, so it'll last forever. They usually have a seal here. Well, this is all uh, uh, calligraphy done by hand. This one's 1829. 1829. And that's actually kind of late. I've seen them uh, 18th century, so before 1800. But they're usually huge like this. They have these, they, were, they, they came folded up. They came over on the boat. Um, and believe it or not, as elaborate they are, and as fancy and old, they're quite common. Cool. Yeah.
in this database alone, there are almost 600 vellum indentured documents, a lot like this. Here's one right here. Since this one is from 1674. See? And they all pretty much look alike. They all have this fancy uh, calligraphic decoration. It's on, again, it's on vellum. A lot of times it's in Latin. This looks like it's in, this is in, this, English. This is in English. Okay. And that one sold for 110 bucks. How big was it? So late 17th century, 28 by 31, about the same size. And that's, that one just sold in June. Where? Clearwater, Florida. But because they're on vellum, they will last forever. Here's, an, here's a nice one. Five. Five antique indentured on vellum from 1650 to 1800. There we go. This indenture. So there it says, this indenture. Just like that one there. Five of them. And all five of them sold for 250 bucks. Okay. So it's beautiful. Uh, you know, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. It's in great condition. Uh, but they're really, really common. Okay. Okay. I didn't know if it was common or not. Yep. Look at that. Mm -hmm. so, so that is uh, in the style of a Tang Dynasty horse or Tang Dynasty. You probably know that. How did you get this wonderful horse? It's from my grandma. Okay. We don't know anything about it at all. Okay. So, so Tang Dynasty horses uh, were tomb figures. They were meant to, to follow the departed into the afterlife. Um, usually when they come out of the tombs today, sometimes they come out of single graves, Sometimes they come out of mass graves, but they're usually in pieces. This one feels like it's bronze. Uh, oh, it's cast iron. So could it have come from like China or Hong Kong? It's not. A, it's not an antique. It's a reproduction. Yeah. 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 So, so a typical Tang Dynasty horse would not have a raised hoof. All four hooves would be on the ground. But, you know, if you dig up, if you dig, I mean, these, this is going back hundreds and hundreds of years. If you dig up the remains of someone who was buried 50 years ago, you're a grave robber. If you dig up the remains of someone who was buried 2,000 years ago, you're an archaeologist. <laughs> so time has a way of taking care of that. So what we have is an iron Tang Dynasty horse. I've never seen one in iron. But there it is. Vintage replica. It might be the same dang horse. It looks like there it. it is. <laughs> what is the? Does it show the bottom? No, there he is. Fifty bucks. Perfect. Right. Okay. <laughs> we knew nine and a half. Nine and a half by twelve. Ship. There you go. There you go. Okay. And then I have this piece, oh. which comes from another grandmother that yeah. I also know nothing about, except that I grew up looking at it, and I <coughs> passed. Oh. This is the style of work by a gentleman named Ben Austrian. There is a signature on it. Somewhere. I see that there is a name down there. But it's hard to read. Copyright 1903, and then the signature is kind of down behind that. So these are, these are I mean, this is a small version of, a, of a, what, what we call yard longs although this is about a foot and a half. Um, so photomechanical print. We talked about this a little bit earlier. A photomechanical print that's been left in the sun will turn this greenish color. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it real closely under a magnifying glass, you see the tiny, tiny dots? Yep. Okay, so when you see that dot matrix, you know that yep. it's a photomechanical print. Um, so Ben Austrian... It's, it's not Ben Austrian, but it's in that style. <coughs> so Ben Austrian did paintings of chicks and ducklings and kittens and puppies. And see, especially chicks. 
like this one. Mm -hmm. See, the same, again, the same basic, this just happens to be ducklings, this just happened to be chicks. They're all going after the same little moth or, and this one's got a, this one's got, looks like a, oh, it's a frog he's yeah. eating. Oh dear, that poor frog. <laughs> he's gone. He's gone. He's gone. So, so this Ben Austrian uh, print of uh, chickens, little chicks going after 1910, same era, very early in the 20th century. That one sold for 130 bucks. This one, less than half that. I would okay. say maybe, maybe $50 on okay. a good day. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, a wonderful pewter covered pot, like a bean pot or something like that. Very nice, nice stamped handle. Hallmarked. 1809. I don't recognize the lettering, but. Yep. I wonder if it might be an urn, perhaps. Yep. Um, you mean like as as in for ashes? Possibly. I couldn't think of what else something of that size would be mm -hmm. used for. Mm -hmm. it's, it's in great condition for for pewter, which is so soft and mostly lead. Mm -hmm. um, how do you come to have this? Uh, it's just been in the family for a long time. I suspect, however that it may be something that my maternal grandmother picked up at a antique store circa 1962 or so it's I don't know for sure it's in it's in pretty good condition I don't know if urn though is quite the right term Mm -hmm. um, it's got somebody's initials on the front, and I don't recognize yeah, them. Yeah, I thought perhaps that might be the initials of the deceased in 1809. Yeah, that, could be. Assuming that the date is correct. Could be. Um, all right, so we've got we've got covered covered vessels and dated and some of them now there's a covered pot see i think it would be just just called a covered pot thought it might be a spittoon but she wouldn't have a top on it no <laughs> no no but that that that's that that that's a good story i mean if you if you wish to attach that story to this i will not object Was so common to use spittoons back then. I That's true. That's true. And you'd be uh, fortunate if, if your guests used it instead of putting it on the floor. It, you know, it's <laughs> it, it's worth mentioning that as lovely as these are, and they were once used for food, they should not. I mean, the, there's so much lead in these things that they should they should not be used for for any type of food today. Um, just purely decorative. Um, Yep, yep, nice date on it. But I mean, this could have been part of a, this could have been a presentation piece that could have been a gift to someone. Um, let's see. Let's try. Does, this, does the stamping indicate anything on the handle there? There's three impressions. Right, it's just a, just a hallmark uh, of, the, of the manufacturer and there was like a, it was a thistle. Yeah, there's a thistle. So I think it's probably Scottish. Yeah. No, no, it's no, it's no, it's a it's a it's like a Habsburg eagle. It's a two-headed eagle. Yeah, it's not a thistle, it's an eagle. I G H 33. Let's try, let's try that. Nope, nothing's coming up for IGH uh, 33. Um, nope. nope. Um, you know, the market for these beautiful covered pieces is still pretty healthy, but it's a, it's a, it's a country antiques, and so they just don't bring what they did before. Um, still, 
hundred and a half, I would think. Mm -hmm. It's got a few nicks and dings, but it's a good good date on the front, all hand decorated. Okay. Yeah, I would say one fifty. I just keep matches in there by the fireplace. Oh yeah, that's a no great food use. or anything. That's that's uh, a great for use it. for it. Good, <laughs> good use okay. there. Okay. Uh, the other item I'm bringing in, or items, are just a small, um, tiny, tiny collection of thimbles that uh, came from my family, and I was just curious to know what era or materials they might okay. have been made from. Okay. Well, these are gold, and these are these are. Specifically, that's rose gold, and they are usually a pretty low carat, but this is this is a beautiful landscape design. I don't know if you can see it. Sailboats on a lake and trees. Art Deco? Um, might be earlier than that. So this is a style. I mean, these are gold, and these should have a carat mark somewhere. Is usually they're usually like ten or twelve carat, but this is a this is a special kind. This is called guilloche decoration. So it's not a term that it's not a style that I usually see on thimbles. So we've got a guilloche thimble, and guilloche return uh, refers to a style of enamel that is that is applied to the piece. Guilloche uh, French or yep. the name of a person? No, that's, it's French. It's G-U-I-L-L-O-C-H-E. Here, for instance, this is a pretty good quality guilloche enamel sterling thimble. We can get it to open up. There it is. See, it's, it's layers of enamel that give this iridescent quality. So this is a guilloche enamel, also probably sterling. That one thimble, look at the top of that one and look at the top of this one. Mm -hmm. Can you see the compare? They're identical. Hmm. See? What era would you guess? Um, let's see. Yeah, it says it's marked 925. Fine quality guilloche enamel Sterling symbol, thimble, uh, early 20th century, 100 years ago. Okay. Yeah. yeah. $70 for one thimble. When did that sell? 2010. Eh, you might not be able to get that for it today. But anyway, it's a guilloche thimble. Okay. Are there any with landscapes? These are all guilloche thimbles. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's four of them. <coughs> $130 for the set. There's another beautiful one. So we're, we're looking at uh, early early 20th. Any idea about the others? No, nope. no. Nope. Just from, this is late 19th or early 20th century for the gold. Okay. I mean, they would they would weigh that one. Okay. This this is these are all sterling. sterling these are all silver? sterling. Yeah. What euro do you think? The same era. All around, all, all late 19th. They're all about 120 years old. Okay. Yeah. This one's a little newer. Okay. Fabulous guilloche. Cool. So what do you know about, I mean, talk about choker, though. Wow. That is a, a tiny, tiny little necklace with a wonderful filigree chain. What do you know about this? That was my aunt's, and I think it's about 100 years old. Yep, I abs absolutely agree. <clears throat> nice faceted piece of glass. Unmarked. I'm, again, I'm sure it was part of a suite. I think it would have had matching earrings, bracelet, and a brooch. Oh. Um, uh, but but beautiful faceted glass with a filigree necklace. Do you ever wear it? <laughs> it's it's um, it's classic um, Edwardian, so I would say circa 1900, 1905. 
Does that fit into your I think into so. the family I think dates? So. Um, the, you know, I mean, it, it's not a it's not a precious gem because you can see that you can you can you know you can see right through it. It's just a wonderful piece of faceted glassware, but good quality. Good quality. Again, unmarked. So I don't think, I don't know, I don't think it's sterling. Absolutely unmarked. Let's see what else we have here. I mean, there is a, a Victorian amethyst Necklace. This one is blue. That one's more, you know, purple that you would expect to see uh, with amethyst. Thirty dollars. There's a pair of them for forty. There's a there's a uh, check glass. I think this is check, mm -hmm. check or bohemian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But because it's unmarked. It just makes it a tougher sell today. But it's absolutely, absolutely in fabulous condition. Yeah, better, better than average quality. There's a, there's a Victorian carved necklace for 90. I'm going to say 50. Okay. It's just gorgeous. Thank you very much. Thanks for your patience. Okay. That's a photograph of a gigantic elk herd. What do we know about this elk waiting for breakfast? Copyright 1911 S.N. Leak, Jackson, Wyoming. What do, where, where, how did this come into your life? I bought it at an auction. Do you like elk? I love wildlife. Oh, I love wildlife too. I love wildlife. This is, this looks like a hand colored photograph. Uh, but I'm not familiar with this with this photographer. S. N. Leak, 1911. Huh? Have you found out? Have you done any research on him? Okay. Okay. Well, it's boy. That's a that those. That's a lot of elk waiting to eat. It says waiting for breakfast. So it must be a it must be a, a domestic herd. I can't imagine that being a domestic herd. S N Leak. Well, there was an S N Leak who did photography. He did panoramic. S N Leak Ranch, Jackson, Wyoming. There is a panoramic photo of uh, elk. Not a very good picture. Scarce vintage railroad panoramic photo at Elk Lodge in the Jackson Hole County reached via the Union. So this was this was a railroad memorabilia. But it's a it's the, an elk herd, probably the same elk herd as this one here. Is there a date on this thing? Uh no. No, but it's SN Leak's Ranch. And that's what it says here. SN Leak. Two and a quarter. And I don't think it's in as good a shape as yours. But that was in 2012. I'm still going to say it's in fabulous condition. Uh, Two hundred dollars. All right. All right. What'd you pay for it? Hundred. A hundred. You did. You did great. That was a, a good investment. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ooh wee. Twenty six Haynes. Hmm. How did this how did this come into your life? My husband bought it for me years and years ago. It's very clearly marked. Uh S S N H trademark. It's got to be it's got to be uh, silver. I think it is. Or nickel silver. The Haynes flute manufactured by William S Haynes Company, Boston Man Now are you a flautist? Mm -hmm. Did I say that right? Or do, yes. do is flutist. I play the flute. You play no. the flute, and you're a flautist. Yes. Okay. Good. Because I knew that I knew flutist is acceptable, but flautist is correct, right? Yes. Okay. 
Oh, it's, it's just gorgeous. Nineteen, yeah, no, 9226 is the style. So that's not a date. That's a, that's a style, style number. Oh, okay. 9226. So do you, do you still play? I do, but this flute is pitched at 335. Uh-huh. And if you play with anybody else, the pitch is 440. Okay. So it's... So if I play that with an ensemble, I'm flat. Oh. See, I'm learning something new every day. It's pitched differently. It's, it's pitched old. differently. Okay. Well, I do, I see many wonderful vintage instruments. Looking at the style of the case, though, I think teens or 20s is about right. Uh, ooh. I think it is a... 26. I have papers. <laughs> okay. Well, the number the number that you can see here is 9226. Okay. Instead of rather than 1926. Okay. But that's still well, here we go. There's one. Looks like the case, looks like the same flute, same case, same everything. 500. Okay. Sterling. There it is. Boston. And that says four, four might be four one six seven, so maybe that's just a numbering sequence. There were several Haynes flutes, and again, this is an auction price five five fifty five hundred nine hundred. There's a Haynes one silver flute, seven fifty four and a quarter one eighty eighteen hundred. 1900 that was three years ago 1100 for most of them are right around five 1600 17 2600 with a gold plating there you go cool but I mean there are there are many contemporary musicians, and I'm sure you know this better than I do, who prefer to play vintage instruments just because of the tone and the sound and the, the quality of the manufacturer, uh, which just can't be duplicated today. So that was a pretty nice gift. Yes, thank yeah. you. Okay, thanks for bringing it. That, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a rose-mauled firkin. Firkin? It's a firkin. Do you know what, what a firkin was used for? Many names? Any firkin thing you want. <laughs> I've been waiting months to use that joke. <laughs> so, so not an antique, but beautifully done. Is it signed anywhere? Okay, someone, someone was showing off their, their rose mauling skills. You know, I mean, that's a that's a... A, a, a tradition we associate with Norway, but there, there, are, there are many contemporary uh, rose mauling artists who work on things like this. So, I mean, a firkin is made the same way a barrel is made. There are staves. Mm -hmm. So, a cooper would have made this. But I've never seen a firkin uh, decorated this way. How do you come to have this? My mother and grandmother had it. I I don't know. And I'm sorry, I didn't know how old it was. I don't know. Well, it's not terribly old, but it's 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 still probably 50 or 60 years old, though. I would say 19, oh. 1950s, oh. um, 1950s or 60s. Oh. Uh, the quality of the rose mauling is really good. Firkins today are collectible if they have old paint, if they are their 19th century. I'll show you here. So what we're looking for is a painted firkin, F-I-R-K-I-N. See, and this is this is tapered. See, there's one in nice old paint. There's one that has some little, you know, again. Finger lap stave. Does this have finger lap? 
it does. There's the, there's the finger lap. Right there. Yeah. yeah. That one sold 19th century finger lap firkin. Uh, 200. There's a small one, 80. There's one with a little more, you know, Dutch design, a sugar bucket or firkin. Anyway, a couple hundred, I would think. Yeah, it's 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 wonderful. Well, this is the time of year to think about to think about taking the kids out for a stroller ride in the sleigh. Oh my gosh! But even the runners, the runners are are on there. Where'd you get this wonderful stroller sleigh? This you know this lady? Yes. Is that okay? That's no lady. That's my wife. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, now this one also, but this has a little more age to it. So, so where'd you get this? Passed down. Just passed yeah, down? Yeah. Okay. Okay. These, these have been around for, you know, a couple hundred years. This one is uh, older. It's older than the Firkin, but I don't think it's more than a hundred years old. I mean, there's a sleigh stroller. There's one right there. That one has a little bit more wicker design, but you see the design is the same. Today, they, they you know, basically, they use them to display dolls and teddy bears. Do you put our dolls and teddy bears? That was my intention. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's in, the condition is great. This is, it's also hand-painted. I think that, I think that the top has been refurbished and the bottom has not been. So I think that this whole piece has been repainted. You can see this one's been left, left untouched. What was that? The pair of those sold for $275. Um, if you saw this in a good antique shop, at $250 to $300 easily. You just don't see them anymore. And the way that they were used uh, and the time of year when they were used, they, they took a toll on them. So uh, not a lot of them, not a lot of them s s survive. Yeah, there's a pair of them, 500 bucks. Stroller and a sleigh. Same basic, same basic construction. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think 250 is about right. Good. Thanks for bringing it. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.